example, when a composer writes a symphony, there's expectations. It's supposed to be a big piece. It's supposed to be a long piece. It's supposed to have a lot of elements, numerous movements. Uh, and Beethoven comes from a tradition, a classical tradition of Mozart and Haydn. He was born in Bonn in Germany and soon uh, emigrated to Vienna. He wanted to go to the music capital of Europe as he saw it. He played for Mozart, did some improvisations. Mozart was very impressed and said, look out, this man will be someone important. He studied a little bit with Haydn, even though his main teacher was Albrechtsberger. He even studied with Salieri. When he started writing his symphonies in the early part of the 19th century, most of his symphonies he wrote in the first decade of the 1800s. The first symphony was a remarkable work, very much in the classical tradition of Haydn and Mozart. The third symphony, the Eroica, is extraordinary, and it's long. Symphonies usually take 25, 30, 35 minutes. All of a sudden, the Eroica is taking 50 minutes. It adds a third horn. It, it, it extends the whole concept of the symphony to a, a larger uh, language than uh, Mozart and Haydn. The fifth symphony is remarkable in lots of ways. Uh, Obviously, the most important thing is the way he developed this little motive. Think about the audience hearing these notes, just played by the clarinets and the strings. And he takes these notes and he develops them throughout the whole movement. And in fact, with the exception of the second movement, that little motive is played in every movement. Something unusual for the time. When you're listening to the symphony, you don't really realize that that motive is going on all the time. You don't even know where it comes from some of the time. And, and in a way, I guess you're not supposed to. You're just supposed to hear it, and all of a sudden it, it's like, oh, this sounds familiar. This is recognizable. It's, it somewhat holds together. But I thought I'd show you a little bit of what he does. Okay, so he takes this, this uh, symphony, and he starts it. it there's, in, a, in a sense, it's a wild energy because it's so much activity. There's these little moving notes constantly. There's no introduction. He just jumps right in. So you're in and you hear this motive, which is in a sense, of course, uh, the first theme. And he, even though um, it's what we call the exposition, the first section of the piece, he develops it somewhat until the horns come in to introduce the second theme. So they play. So obviously it's the same, three short and a long, but instead of, it goes. So he expands the, the uh, uh, interval from to, and then he writes the second theme. all within the framework of what the horns have just done. Speaking about Beethoven is hard because his name is so famous. And the romantic image of Beethoven is so ingrained in our memory. Some of it is pretty true, that he was quite eccentric and mad and impolite. Uh, and unpredictable. He was also, and that's very important, deaf. And he was deaf when he wrote this symphony. It's very important to remember, because a musician who is going deaf is losing his purpose for life. And the symphony is very closely related to thoughts of suicide that the composer had, uh, which he confided in a famous private letter. Uh, he was also a great virtuoso, which means he expected to have a brilliant career, and he uh, came from a pretty tough family with a drunken father who was a musician. And the important thing is to realize that he came to Vienna in 1791, the year Mozart died, and he studied with Haydn, but he wanted to become the heir, you know, as in any dynasty. You know, he wanted to be the next big star in this world of classical music, 
which was dominated by patrons, kings and queens and counts and uh, royalty and aristocracy. And they were all amateurs. So he was writing for his patrons. They were really the public. There wasn't really a large public out there, people who subscribed to music magazines, but there was no public concerts in the ordinary sense. He put on concerts himself. In fact, the concert that was done when the Beethoven Fifth Symphony was premiered together with the Sixth Symphony, it was a public concert. But that public is a really an elite public. So it's, you know, it's Park Avenue and the Gold Coast of Chicago and just a couple of people. And, and that's it. So it's not a mass public as we know it. And, um, but he's communicating to them and he's showing um, how good he is at something new. Uh, we think of classical music always as people listening to things that they already know that are old. That wasn't the case in the early 19th century. In addition, there was a tradition of um, symphonies that were sort of battle symphonies that entertained people. There were no moving pictures, so people sat around and they half listened to something tell a story in a very tone-painting way, illustrative way. You hear birds, you hear cannons, and stuff like that. So now he comes up with the idea he's going to do something that is going to impress his patrons and that also expresses, in a way, his own sensibility. So his personal subjective feelings become the subject of the symphony in his mind, which is why the first great review of the symphony called it the really the high point of romanticism, because here is the subjective personality expressing himself. And he does it with utter brilliance and economy. He takes this very simple musical idea. It's like a game, like an improvisatory game. You take the simplest musical idea, four notes, and can you make a castle out of four notes? And indeed he does. Did you ever wonder what the conductor's doing up there? Obviously, when the conductor's waving his hands, he's not making any sound. The musicians are making all the noise or all the music, and these, in this case, this great orchestra making these great performances. Well, we do have a little influence on what goes on, and I thought it'd be interesting to take a few moments in this first movement of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony and tell you what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about while I'm doing it. First, I have to give you a little elementary music lesson, which if you know it, you can skip past this, but there are a few things we need to know. If you look at the first page of the score, you'll see it says 2-4 at the beginning of the line. 2-4 means that there are two beats in every measure, and a quarter note is getting a beat. So the first question is, what's a measure? If you look at that score, you'll see a line. It's called a bar line. You'll have a few notes and a bar line. That is a measure. It's either a bar or a measure. Two beats in each one of those little measures and a quarter note gets a beat. So what's a quarter note? Well, you have to understand, in this case, just three note values. A quarter note, like a fraction, one four, it's a black note with a stem. A eighth note, which is a black note with a line and an extra flag and a half note, which is a white note with one stem. They are fractions. So how many quarter notes do you get in a half note? Well, two. How many eighth notes do you get in a half note? Four. And that's the whole point. That's it. It's very simple. The other things you need to know, you need to know what a fermata is. A fermata is a sign that a composer puts down for the conductor, performer, to hold a note longer than what's written, but without a specific amount of time. You can judge it on your own. The other thing we have is we have a tie. and The tie is where two half notes are being held together. The tie means you don't re-articulate, you don't repeat that note. So to, to back up again, two, four, how many beats in a measure? Two. What kind of note gets a beat? That's a quarter note. You have an eighth note with a flag, quarter note, no flag, and a half note, which is white, not black. A bar or a measure, we have a bar line. Pretty simple. 
Now let's look some more at the score. It says Allegro con brio, which means fast, with uh, bravura, brio. Uh, it also says, if you see, half note equals 108. So what does that mean? Well, that's the tempo, the tempo that the composer recommends. It doesn't mean you have to do that, but if I would punch a metronome in, that's 108. There's something important about that. He says a half note equals 108, which means that he believes that the P should be felt per bar, one beat per bar rather than two, even though he wrote it in two, four. Okay, now you know all the fundamental material. So let's look at what I do and how it relates to uh, the piece and the performance. The most important thing, you notice that the very first bar has two Fs. That means loud, very loud, almost the loudest that we can do. And it starts with this little rest. So one more thing to know is a rest. The little rest uh, means you don't play. So if you look at the first measure or the first bar, there's an eighth rest and three eighth notes. The famous three notes, ba ba ba, and then it arrives on the half note, ba, with a fermata. So what does the conductor have to do? He has to give a good upbeat. That's when he brings his hands up. That's an upbeat, and then boom, downbeat. So it's crucial to have a good upbeat and a good downbeat. The upbeat and downbeat indicate what the tempo is going to be. Great orchestras like this one, you give a sign like that, and, and they know exactly how to play. From the first time we played this through, they knew exactly what the tempo was. Then we hold that half note with intensity. We don't let it get softer. There is no decrescendo. There is no diminuendo. Beethoven says, keep it loud. Then he has another eighth rest. So if you count to the third bar, there's another eighth rest, three more notes, going to another half note, this time tied to an, a second half note with a fermata, indicating probably should be a little bit longer. Okay, so the conductor, I give a Good solid upbeat. So if you, if you notice, we do a slow motion now. I begin from a downward position. I raise my hand and I give a big strong downbeat. This indicates the tempo and when the musicians should start. Then I hold with intensity. So my hand is strong to just reinforce the idea to the musicians that they shouldn't get softer. And then I do another wind up, upbeat, and another big downbeat to, again, have those four notes played fortissimo.
if you look at a violin, it's very much like a human body. Um, it has shoulders, and we call this the neck. And this is, it's not the head, but we call it the scroll. It's like a rolled piece of paper scroll. And um, these are the ribs and the back. And um, a violin is made from kind of the same trees you might see in your backyard, uh, spruce and maple. Um, this one was made in 1757 in Milan, Italy, by a man named Guadagnini. And um, all the men in the Guadagnini family made violins. And so um, it's really a work of art. Uh, it's amazing that it's so old, and yet it's in really good condition, real healthy. And um, these, uh, these things are, uh, these are all modern things that we put on here. This is called a tailpiece uh, that kind of holds the strings in place. This is, well, it looks like a bridge, and that's what we call it. It's a bridge. This is a board where we put our fingers, so it's called a fingerboard. And this is where I rest, rest my chin, so we call it a, a chin rest. In violin, we have different positions. The one that's furthest away from me is first position. And then I have second position, third position, fourth position, fifth, sixth, seventh. I go up to about eighth position or so. Now, when I go from one position to the next, I like to think of it like I'm taking an elevator to a different floor. Like in first position, I'm going to the third position. I'll just kind of open the elevator door and go up to the third floor and close the door, and now I'm in the third, third floor, and then I do whatever I need to do there. Now, sometimes going from the first to the third floor, I want to be very clean. But sometimes I want to give it a little style and a little bit of something a little spicy. Then I might do what's called a slide, in which case I don't hide anything that's going on as my elevator is going from the first to the third floor. I actually show it to my audience. And uh, that, so that slide is a very personal thing that violinists can use to bring the music to life. Concertmaster is basically the quarterback of the team. The head coach is the same thing as the conductor. They really control everything that's going on. But my job as concertmaster is to kind of read the mind of the conductor, what their wishes are musically, and try to transmit that to my colleagues through facial expressions, body motions, maybe the tilt of my head, maybe the way I move the bow. Having a momentary solo passage in a symphony is, well, let me put it to you this way. Um, I read an article in the paper recently where they put heart monitors on firemen. And apparently, the time when there is no fire, when they're sitting around playing checkers at the firehouse eating chili, their heart rate is very low. They're very healthy and strong people. But when they enter the burning house, their heart rate goes dangerously high. Boom, 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 and it stays up there until they leave the danger. That's me. I feel that when I see it coming up, I can usually see, I usually circle the place that says solo, my solo, in red pencil. So we turn the page in the middle of the piece, and I can see it coming up. I can just feel my heart rate start to go faster and faster. And I basically say three words to myself, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it. And then at that moment when I start playing, I almost screaming it out, I'm screaming it out in my head, go for it.
The story of the Firebird involves just a few characters. So the Firebird, Ivan the Prince, Kashai the Monster, 13 princesses and some other uh, monsters that uh, the uh, Kashai has created. He's immortal and he petrifies people. It's a terrible thing and uh, Ivan arrives in front of the monster's castle and uh, he sees, it's, it's, it's dark, but he hears and sees a firebird. He captures her. He was hunting, not for firebirds, but he captures her and she begs for her release. He releases her and she says, whenever you need help, I will be there for you. Next, 13 princesses come out of the castle and do a round dance. He falls in love with one of them. Uh, they return to the castle, and the next day, Ivan goes to this monster, this Kashai sorcerer, and says, I'd like to marry one of these princesses. Will you give me permission? They get into a quarrel, and the monster gets all of his monstrous friends to uh, run after Ivan. At this moment, the firebird comes back to repay the uh, freedom that she received and to help him. She gets all of those monsters to do an infernal dance and they do this infernal dance and at the end of the infernal dance they all fall asleep because they're all so tired. This is a chance for Ivan to get away. Kashai wakes up. She gets him once again to engage in a dance, tells Ivan how to go about uh, breaking the spell and how to kill this monster. He does marries the princess, uh, all the uh, petrified people become normal, and uh, everybody's happy and life goes on wonderfully after that. The premiere was in 1910, the first suite was in 1911. The suite that we play is from 1919. It's in six basic sections. The introduction to the Firebird sets the mood, tone of Ivan arriving in front of this castle. The mood is set by muted strings, viola cellos playing unison together. The bass is also playing with them, but the basses are divided. Half of them are playing what we call arco with the bow, and half of them have played pizzicato, plucking the string. You can also notice that the bass drum is the only other instrument playing a role underneath, again, to create the suspension. In short order, the woodwinds come in, and this is Ivan's entrance into that, that meadow in front of the castle. Besides the low woodwinds and the horn, you have trombone, two trombones also just creating the image of what uh, Ivan is feeling in the forest, a little glissando on the harp, just little, little gestures that set the mood in an extraordinary way. Next thing we find is uh, all of a sudden there's a shimmering section of the strings. They play a quick note loud and then they do a tremolo to create a kind of activity without any specific musical gesture. It's not a melody. It does relate to the harmony but it's not significant. Then the upper strings and the woodwinds come in in a very skittery way and you know that this is obviously the firebird. And then we get to the first solo for the firebird. As you look at it you'll see that it's all woodwinds. It's piccolo, flutes, clarinets, and then eventually the strings come in and add a little something. But again, it's repeated, it's very clear, it's short, and it's the first solo for the Firebird, these variations.